Welcome to the webinar, where today we'll be looking at cybersecurity essentials on the IBMI. This webinar has been developed by Proximity, your premier partner for IBMI solutions, support and development. And as our name suggests, we achieve this through working closely with our partners. We're in your corner. Before we start, it would be nice to know who's speaking today. My name is Andrew Nicholson. I enjoyed 25 years in enterprise solutions, including 10 plus years within the IBMI community, advising and supporting customers to continue and grow their business applications and help them become more modern, secure, productive and profitable. So first, I'd like to reassure everyone that while cybersecurity on the IBMI isn't easy, it also doesn't have to be hard either. In this session, we'll deal with the foundational aspects of cybersecurity. Now, we'll deal with individual topics in more detail at greater depth at a later date. So please bear this in mind. Today, we aim to provide a practical advice and tips on what you can do now to tighten the ship. We'll discuss the threats, their severity, what we can do to counter, and we'll provide useful details to get started with policy and procedure too. Now there's a lot to get through, so let's get started. Okay, so for many reasons, IBM I shops are overwhelmed with securing the IT infrastructure. We're busy with the day-to-day, -day, the system administration, responding to user and management requests and requirements, and maintaining and building the applications that run our business. So where does IBM I security fit in? What do we do and how do we manage? Now, many shops already have certain things set up that are working. And despite a moving security landscape, many of these elements have been in place for years. If you're watching this, you'll probably have an idea that these should at least be reviewed, perhaps revisited or revised, maybe even replaced. Indeed, as detailed within this year's IBM I Marketplace survey of top concerns as compiled by Help Systems, the findings are that for the sixth year running, cybersecurity continues to top the charts as the main concern facing IBM I IT professionals. And ironically, disaster recovery comes in a close second, and we'll discuss how this could form part of your strategy later. Today, we'll be focusing on the former and providing some background and practical advice to supporting security within the IBMI community. But why is cybersecurity at the top of the survey's concerns? The IBMI is a secure platform, right? Well, IBMI industry leaders fresh alongside IBM and financial paper Forbes asked that same question within their 2022 cybersecurity reports. Now, the findings were stark, with 43% of organizations do not have any cybersecurity at all in place. 61% of small and medium-sized businesses reported a cyber attack. 83% of organizations are not financially prepared to recover from a cyber attack. The disruption of some of these attacks can be crippling. Imagine your business system is being down for days or even weeks, no access to files, employees cannot connect, customers cannot transact. The effects can be devastating. And with nearly 50% of IBMI shops having little to no security knowledge or skills, the threats are present and real to the IBMI community. But what are the greatest concerns that are keeping security professionals up at night? Well, as detailed by the CyberEdge CDR report, for the seventh year in a row, malware tops the list. Now, this is on a scale of one to five, with five being the highest concern. These results aren't that remarkable since malware is the key component to ransomware, phishing, and targeted attacks. The surprise is that credential abuse or inside threats and account takeovers have moved from outside the top four to number two ahead of ransomware, which, while not is the greatest concern, in fact holds the greatest threat to business. More on this later. 
But how do these concerns tally with the demands of the IBMI professional tasked with keeping their business safe and secure? And how do we deal with the threats involved? Because after all, the IBMI is a safe platform, right? And surely because of this, despite the viruses and other malware, the IBMI is impervious. Well, while the architecture of the IBMI makes it less likely that viruses could be written for it, more than mainstream platforms for sure. Unfortunately, there are always security fault lines in every business and flaws can be exploited in every architecture. So yes, Unix, Windows, Linux can be vulnerable and indeed, our own beloved IBMI has weaknesses too. We'll now take a little time to go through these and provide an insight in threat severity and some practical advice on what to look for, how to manage these, and a few pointers to get you started. I've summarized these into six areas. The first one being who has access to your system, or in security terms, identity and access management. And this is the foundation area in which your security should be built. I think the correct permissions and access privileges is pivotal in minimizing threats. Password management to support unauthorized access, apply strong password rules, is a necessity. The road to regulation compliance starting with Cyber Essentials and the more advanced ISO 27001. How the IBMI can in fact be an incubator for malicious software and what can be done to prevent this. Phishing and how to spot and stop threats through education and a robust readiness against ransomware, recognized as the greatest threat to business continuity in 2022. But we'll start by discussing who has access to your systems to mitigate risk of unauthorized access. Profiles and privileges. What do we need to look at here? Well, profile management is one of the more critical areas of your IBMI server. Managing user profile privileges and passwords are absolutely must-haves in any security implementation. Many organizations allow too many user profiles with administration privileges. This means there's nothing to stop employees from accessing or deleting unauthorized files, even should this be by accident. Regardless, you need to manage this. So within privilege management, you may want to consider limiting the availability of powerful user profiles. The more profiles you have on your system with privileged special authorities, the bigger the threat. All object access is perhaps the biggest risk outside of the required IT administration. This special authority gives the user extensive authority over all resources of the system. They can view, change, or delete any object, plus grant other users the authority too. So great if you're an IT admin, but certainly not appropriate for the general user. And there's more besides this that you should be perhaps looking at. For example, you don't want your users to have the ability to create another user profile. There are permissions for this, and these are granted through security administration privileges. Should a user have this privilege, then they have the ability to delete documents and folders, add and remove access codes, add user plus give, and remove permissions for users on another user's behalf. Again, great for IT admin, but not privileges for the average user. Therefore, it may be worth looking at investigating the current privileges your users have. Do you recognize all users? Are there redundant users that can be removed? Are some of your users on a higher privilege level than necessary? You may then document these with their levels of permissions by department and where appropriate user. And on completion, you could then monitor which you have access and control employees, leverages access through unexpected entry points. So looking at user access may provide a positive start in securing your system. Great. But there's further problems today as historically access was granted through the front door or in plain english this is the menu system that provides the shield that blocks the users from accessing anything other than he or she has permission to view today we have backdoors that provide connections other than through the menu system when you have all these kinds of connections available 
And please bear in mind that the TCP servers are running by default on the system, you can have a major hole. As such, if you don't have a solution to monitor and control activities, then someone with authority could change and delete any file, corrupt or create programs, and you'd be completely blind to this. Now, there are methods to counter this, and you could look at a solution that protects and secures remote access to and from the IBMI, or in other words, a software-based firewall. When looking for a suitable firewall, consider solutions that not only provide exit point controls for all the backdoors, but will also provide a complete audit trail with the bonus of enjoying an intuitive management console. Now, again, a deep dive into this subject will be saved for a future session. But suffice to say, thankfully, there are many capable firewalls available for modern IBMI enterprise that addresses these issues, and we'd be happy to discuss your requirements further. But not before we continue with providing you with the security foundations, including password management. Now, unsurprisingly, passwords remains one of the more important areas of security and could be pivotal in avoiding unauthorized access to your servers. So what can we look at here? Well, first, many IBMI shops don't restrict the number of tries an unauthorized user can use to crack another user's password. This hole in security results in excessive or unlimited sign-on hacking attempts. To rectify this, you could look at security system values so that an authorized users only have a limited number of tries to guess a user's password before the user and the device used are disabled in the system. Now, get your pen and paper ready as we're gonna go through some of these helpful system values. So first, to set a maximum number of sign-on attempts, you could use a maximum attempts system value. For example, setting this value to three would mean a user would only have three attempts to enter the correct password before the system takes action. Next, you could consider the action on reaching maximum attempts. There's a system value for this too. You may set the action when sign-on attempts reached to system value on two to disable profile or three to disable device and profile. Now, with a attempts limits in place, you may wish to look at the passwords themselves. So traditionally, IBMI servers had weak passwords due to the limitations in older operating systems. But with technology advancements, IBM have introduced a new system value to I. Now this will include password levels. This relatively recent feature, I think it was in 7.2, allows passwords to be as strong as any other platform. Previously, it had been all too easy for users to put in the name of their cat, the dog, the date of birth, something easily remembered but equally easily found. To compensate for this, you could use the IBMI password composition system value to review and set up specific password rules of what types of passwords users can enter. Some of the restrictions may, you may look at include restricting certain characters for passwords. If this is something you'd like to consider, we have the restricted characters for password system value. This feature allows you to specify characters that cannot be used in a password. Now, if you wish to restrict the use of repeated characters, you may use the system value of restriction of repeated characters for passwords. And as you'd expect, this prevents users from repeating the same character consecutively in a password, eliminating simple passwords such as AAAAA or BBBBB, et cetera, et cetera. Get the picture. Next up, you may also prevent users from entering dates, addresses, or other consecutive numbers. For this, you may use the system value for restriction of consecutive digits for passwords. Finally, should you wish to restrict the user from reusing and recycling old passwords, there's a system value to prevent this too. The prevent reuse of password system value sets the number of password changes from four through to 32 password change cycles. So, did you get all that? Now there's a test at the end of a webinar. Don't worry, of course there isn't, but if you didn't have a pen to hand, Here's a quick summary for you to scribble down or do a screen grab. 
And should you not be able to do that, don't worry, this session, I hope, is being recorded. Uh, and you'll have a link to this in your inbox within the next 24 hours. So once we've looked at password controls and they're in place, you may wish to look at introducing policy for your users to follow. For example, passwords should not be based on your personal information, should be at least 12 characters long, should contain three of the following four characteristics, uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and special characters, should be unique, should not follow a pattern, should not be stored in an easy accessible location, should be changed at given time periods, and could be based on three memorable random words. However, if you would like to distill all this best practice and policy while simultaneously adding greater security functionality, thankfully there are excellent IBM centric software solutions available that can manage this for you. Reset passwords, plus provide multi-factor authentication, including verification pins via email and SMS if necessary. A step above what can be offered by the OS as default. Should this ease of management and added level of security be appealing, then please do contact a member of Proximity team, ideally me. Now, hopefully that past few minutes speaking about access privileges and password management has provided you with a great foundational start to your security journey. Again, many of these uh, features will deep dive in at a later date. However, there is more, and I'd like to move forward now with phishing and discuss what phishing is and give you an idea of what to look for and the best practices against phishing attacks. So what is phishing? Well, phishing is a type of social engineering where an attacker sends a fraudulent message by email, SMS, or on social media too. They design the content so it looks as if it comes from a trusted provider, such as your bank, a business, or an online account, for example. But it's fraudulent and it's designed to trick a person into clicking a link or calling a number with the ultimate result being that the person disclosing sensitive information to the attacker or indeed to deploy malicious software on the victim's infrastructure, such as ransomware. So the rule here is to always question the source. Or as Abraham Lincoln once quite famously said, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Wise words indeed from the 16th president of the United States. So one that quite not quite as pertinent to the IBMI, phishing can have ramifications for your enterprise as clicking a link can lead to details being stolen or land malware. But the average Joe wouldn't be susceptible to this, surely. Well, a recent Kaspersky study looked at how many users in a given region had attempted to open phishing links in 2021. Brazil had the worst figures, with 12.39% of users trying to open phishing links, that was down from 19.94% from the previous year. In the UK, we saw roughly half of Brazil's figures with 6.42%, which is down from 2020's 9.75%. So not too high, right? Well, to put this in context, this means that for every 100 staff using your enterprise systems, nearly seven of these may be prone to clicking a malicious link. So phishing continues to be a danger. Indeed, a cybersecurity survey emailed last year, 83% of respondents said they had experienced a phishing attack. The other 17% were afraid to reply to the survey. Boom, boom. Ah, sorry, poor joke, but we're halfway through. So a bit of a pick me up. But the point still stands that you should be aware and question the source. But how do we get this message across to the staff? Thankfully, this can be easily resolved and it's mainly an educational issue. I could go into detail, but much of what I'd say would already be contained within the National Cybersecurity Center's online training for staff. We've used this at proximity and you may wish to look at adding this free cyber training to your staff too. Within the training, you'll find practical advice written in plain English that'll guide your staff through the essentials on phishing and passwords. Okay, moving on. 
while authority management, password policies and security, education are all soft measures controlled in-house, there are further hard areas that you may want to look at. One such area is ransomware, which, as discovered within the 2022 Cyber Threat Defence Report, is the greatest threat to business this year. Now, within this report, as compiled by CyberEdge, was found that in the UK, 81.4% of organisations had experienced at least one cyber attack in the year prior to the study. Now, this may sound high, but the worst hit countries such as Colombia, Turkey and Spain had figures closer to 95%. And the costs of a successful attack are astronomical. In 2021, ransomware cost the US economy alone a total of $159.4 billion in downtime alone. But it's with individual businesses where the effects are felt most. Back here in the UK, the average cost to recover from a ransomware attack was £1.1 million, with data breaches escalating to over £4.1 million. However, 43% of ransomware attacks in the UK were stopped prior to the data encryption, with 13% of UK organisations ending up paying the ransom. So the statistics are quite scary, but there are some simple actions to help mitigate risks in these areas. Let's go through these right now. First, backup and recovery. Up-to-date backups are the most effective way of recovering from ransomware attacks. This goes for all your enterprise systems, but especially for your IBMI. Make sure these are offline and isolated and kept separate, ideally in a different location. Use the 3 to one rule, at least three copies on two devices and one off-site. This strategy is popular because it scales effectively including the use of cloud for an off-site backup. And you can give you the confidence that your critical data is safe from a localized incident. To support this, you can use disaster recovery and high availability solutions. There are plenty available for the IBMI. And we'd be happy to help source the right solution for you. Why? Well, normally backups do not support restoration of data just prior to the point of encryption or deletion. HA provides the ability to not only mirror live production systems in real time, but also supports point in time retrieval of data. The ability to scroll back and restore the last occurrence of uncorrupted data provides peace of mind that should the worst happen, you can get up and running in short order. Cyber criminals are always looking for vulnerabilities. Thankfully, IBM has an excellent track record of producing updates with additional functionality. Updates are more importantly security fixes, and it's therefore important that you apply any of these PTFs in a timely manner. We'd recommend looking at putting these as part of your plans and policy. Speaking of which, prepare for an unlikely incident, even if you think it would be unlikely. Create a response plan so your IT security team knows what to do during a ransomware event or even all aspects of cybersecurity. Things to look at include identifying your critical assets and determining the impact to these if they were affected by a malware attack. Defining roles of communication so that the people responsible can communicate effectively with the right information with the right stakeholders in a timely manner. Determine a response with senior management on how the business will respond to the demands and threats. Define a process on how to rebuild any environments and physical servers and what processes are needed to be followed up to restore files from your backup solutions. And while all this is going on, what you need to plan now and how you could, if possible, continue operating the business if all these things are happening. But perhaps the most important component within ransomware protection is within the adoption of a third party solution that proactively protects against such attacks. When investigating such solutions, you may wish to look at the following functionality. Something that provides real time protection to identify and stops and reports events, automatically updates the threats database. 
provide protection against viruses that may disable such protection, can be integrated with a scheduler and has a complete audit trail for reporting. Now again, through our extensive partnership network, Proximity is in an excellent position to help support your ransomware protection requirements. But before we do so, we should also discuss elements which could be part of your cybersecurity element. Another way to protect against ransomware and a further basic building block of data security is encryption. It's the simplest and most important way to ensure a computer system's information can't be stolen and read by someone who wants to use it for malicious purposes, and also becoming more of a prerequisite with GDPR rules. IBMI encryption can be done using a variety of techniques depending upon the business needs or audit requirements. If you need a check mark to say, yes, we encrypt, it can be done through tape encryption via hardware. If you need to encryption at rest, it's a little more difficult. Typically encryption at the hardware level is done through a SAN or an IASP and can be expensive. While software encryption can be done by user exits or by using third party tools. Each has its pros and cons and I've summarized these here. Again, this is a topic in itself, so we'll quickly look at this and the areas in which you can investigate now while addressing this in a more involved webinar at a later date. Now, since 7.1, IBM I has encryption built into the operating system. You access this through field procedures for field level encryption in the DB2. There are resources out there to support writing a field procedure, but a few considerations to get you started. First, the entire process is automated with no need for application changes. You just need to identify all the fields you want to encrypt, the exit point software, and activate it. However, registering programs may magnify overheads, creating performance deterioration. A field pro program calls operations like an external program call and every interface that it writes to or reads values from an encryption column is affected. So depending upon your situation, it's therefore recommended you limited the encryption to needed files only. A field proc program can be recalled regardless of the application or interface used. Therefore, third-party software providers should support the DB field proc interface. Also bear in mind that a field proc program must begin with an ILE program. There are no exceptions, no SQL is allowed be told. <laughs> Finally, when you're writing the procedure, you cannot have any other locks on the file. You will need to look at an exclusive lock while the alter statements are running. So to check this, consider the change object attributes authority on the object statement and make sure the authority class is set to use. Now, should you wish to reduce the technical expertise needed for field level encryption, there are vendors who provide security designed on IBM I specifically for this and other cybersecurity functions too. This third party alternative provides the field level encryption without the technical headaches associated. And should you wish to investigate these further, we'd be happy to support these activities. Now, with these foundations in place, we may also want to investigate a formal cybersecurity accreditation. I'll briefly introduce these, starting with Cyber Essentials. Now, Cyber Essentials is a government-backed scheme that enables any type of and size of business to become cyber secure from a web attack. It's not quite as simple as the government makes it out to be to attain. And to do so, you'd need to demonstrate your business has the five cyber essential controls in place. These are boundary firewalls. That's your outermost barrier to the web. Secure configuration. So how difficult it is to get into your systems. User access control. Who has permissions to the data and installation of software, for example. Malware protection. Continuous detection of malicious software and detection in place and updated regularly, and 
patch management, ensuring there are no flaws in software, which can be in any way a threat or way in for cyber criminals. Cyber Essential is the first step as it's a self-assessment where you, the applicant, needs to be able to answer questions and provide evidence you have the five technical controls implemented. Cyber Essentials Plus is a verified version of the self-assessment. An external assessor tests and therefore proves that the technical controls are in place. For certification, a business needs to demonstrate that they have all these five technical controls implemented and that they are working sufficiently to stop any risk of breach. Should your business be international, then you may wish to look at the International Organization for Standardization Certificate 27001, or ISO 27001 for short. This is an internationally recognized standard for information security management. Now, this is a more expansive certification and it requires organizations to systematically examine the organization's information security risks, taking into account the threats, vulnerabilities and impacts, design and implement a coherent and comprehensive suite of information security controls and all other forms of risk assessment to address those risks that are deemed unacceptable and adopt an overarching management process to ensure the information security controls continue to meet the organization's information security needs on an ongoing basis. Now, Proximity are Cyber Essentials Plus accredited and are in the process of attaining ISO 27001 accreditation too. Now, a few years ago, Target had a data breach. 41 million credit cards and 110 million personal accounts were stolen. This breach was hugely damaging to the company, not just for its reputation, but through a loss of business. A subsequent lawsuit cost them a total of nearly $300 million. Now, while the lessons learned in this webinar would have prevented the success of such attacks, it's sensible and good practice to consider adding appropriate insurance too. So within the past 35 minutes, we've covered much and we hope you found the session to be of great value. But to recap, we've covered access management, who has access to your systems, their privileges accordingly, password management, including system values to get you up and running. We discussed regulation compliance policies, procedures, including cyber essentials and ISO certification, phishing, and how susceptible our enterprise is, and the implementation of continual soft measures to resolve this, encryption, and why this is the simplest and most important way to ensure a computer system's information cannot be stolen, and finally, ransomware, why it's the greatest threat to business and simple ways in which we can mitigate risk. There's plenty of elements to consider. And should you be wondering where to start to support the IBM I community in their cyber security journey, we're offering a free IBM I security assessment. This assessment will include and allow you to understand your IBM I vulnerabilities and will provide a report in a CSV or a spool file. We'll test your authorizations and system level securities. We'll also test your exit points to remote servers and sockets and complete password tests for duplicates, adjacent disk digits, repeating characters, and so on. Plus, provide checks for user profiles not used over the past 90 days, power users, and profiles. And resource and restore management, including IFS security and object verification. If this is something in which uh, you think would be a benefit and will help start or further your IBM I security journey, please do get in touch. Thank you for your time and consideration today. Again, this is just a foundational session. We will deep dive into individual subjects and have more demonstrations and talk about them in more detail in later sessions. But thank you for your time today. Uh, if we have any questions, we will answer these offline in an email and we'll put these as part of a blog within uh, our email section. 
on our video section on our site. Now, speaking of which, uh, please do check on previous webinars on rapidly developing web applications from your IBM I using WebSmart, green screen modernization using Presto, and the application documentation using X Analysis. All three videos are available now on our website in the video section, and hopefully this session will also be available on our video sessions within the next week or two. So please do visit our website regularly. Thank you again for joining us. We would encourage you to get in contact should you have any further questions, are interested in the free cybersecurity assessment, or require additional information. But for now, on behalf of Proximity and I, we'll wish you a very good day and hope to speak with you again soon. Many thanks and goodbye.